It's good to see you this morning. Um, welcome. My name's Tim, one of the pastors here, and um, we are going to spend a little bit of time this morning um, just kind of looking at the book of Acts, which we've done for uh, a few weeks. Um, and uh, the book of Acts is, is found in the New Testament. It's really the book that gives us the details of the beginning of the Christian church, uh, kind of what they did, the adventures that God uh, took uh, those men and women on. Uh, and we're going to be looking at that this morning. Can I just ask, like, before I get going, do you ever find that, like, when you have got to concentrate on something uh, and you've got to get your head down because you know there's something you've got to do and think quite deeply about, that your mind just starts to wander? Does that ever happen to you? Happens to me, you know. Um, I'm sitting there thinking about something and my mind starts to wander and I think, hmm, I wonder what I should have for lunch today. You know, or I really need to fix something on the front door that's not quite right or... Do chocolate peanut M&Ms really just only melt in your mouth and not in your hand? You know, I have these kind of, my, and I'm thinking, no, 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 hang on a minute, I've got to concentrate because I've got to think about something. Well, that's kind of happened to me over the last week or so as I've been trying to concentrate and think about this passage that we're going to be looking at today. I, I kind of sat there and tried to think about it, and every time I thought about it, I just found my mind wandering um, and thinking, actually, of all things about ice cream and chocolate sauce, actually. It was like 6.30 in the morning, and I was, I was sitting there on a chair at home just trying to have a think and read and pray about this passage, and all I'm thinking about is ice cream. I mean, I've got it on the brain. <laughs> it was awful. We had staff prayers on Tuesday. We, have, like, we pray as a staff team every, every week, and one of the things we pray about is like, you know, what's coming up on Sunday, and kind of said, guys, I've got to be honest. I'm trying to think about what to say, but all I can think about at the moment is chocolate sauce. So they, they prayed for me, uh, and that was great. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at some of the verses that I'm going to be looking at today, and then a little bit later on, I would like to talk about ice cream and chocolate sauce, if that's okay. So let's just have a look at this passage first. Um, read, we're going to start in um, Acts chapter 4, uh, verses um, 29 to 36, just to kind of give you some sort of uh, context of what's happening so far. Some of the Christians have been going out and healing the sick and telling people about Jesus. Uh, and as they've been going around doing that, the Jewish religious leaders at the time, they, they don't like it at all. And they ask them, would you please stop doing that? Um, to which they reply, no, we, we can't. We just, we just can't help speaking about Jesus. Um, and, but they say, no, we're not asking you. We're telling you, you you've got to stop. Uh, and then they reply to these religious leaders, they say, well, who should we obey, you or God? I mean, that is like, oh, that's a killer, isn't it? You know, who should we obey, you or God? It's like, don't, you know, when you put it like that, it's like if your kids say to you, you know, you ask them to eat your fish pie or something, and they say, well, God's told me not to, who should I obey, you or God? It's like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. But so they say, well, you know, I don't know what to do, we can't. I go against God, but so what they do is they just threaten them, uh, and then they send them on their way. And these Christians, they come back, um, and they gather with all the other believers, and they begin to meet in a room, and they begin to pray. And that's where we're going to pick up um, the narrative, just as they're kind of bringing their prayers to an end. They say this, they're still praying, and they say, God, I enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus." And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that, they were, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. And Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And what you have here is an account of the first group of Christians. Um, and what you have is a description of what the church is and what it ought to be. And that description that I've just read is, is quite staggering. It's a place where those who were a part of it 
were one in heart and mind. And what does that mean? It means there was like this complete sense of unity. The church in Acts was made up of all different types of people, just like our church is. You know, as young and old, male and female, people from all different kind of backgrounds, people that are in work, people that are out of work. The church is kind of like this random group of people that are kind of thrown together that you probably wouldn't get in any other setting. Yet despite their differences, we read that all of them are one in heart and mind. There's no footnote, actually, that says, you know, all of them were one in heart and mind, but there's a little footnote, if you look in Acts, that says, apart from those three or four people that were just, quite frankly, really annoying, you know, that, you know, every church has. No, it doesn't say that. It says, no, all, all of them, every one of them was united. All means all. It wasn't that there was just like lots of different groups in the church, you know, lots of different groups that within those little groups, they were one in heart and mind. So there was a kind of group that shared a similar interest that met, and within that group, they were one in heart and mind. There was a a group of people that all were kind of going through the same sort of stage of life, and within that group, they were all one in heart and mind. No, it's, it's everyone. All means all. Total unity, total oneness. No cliques, no divisions complete unity. That's the extent of their relational unity that Luke is describing. And that oneness is not just kind of relational, it's material as well. It wasn't just that they were kind of one in heart and mind when it came to the things that they were doing as a church together. You know, they they had complete unity when they thought about, you know, their mission as a church or or the things that they were going to do in the community in which they live. It wasn't just that they were you know, one in heart and mind when it came to kind of scriptural interpretations and stuff, but it kind of ended there. Now, their oneness spilled out into every aspect of their lives, even to the point of how they viewed their money and their possessions. And it says, no one claimed any of their possessions was their own. They didn't have like an individualistic mentality when it came to their stuff, but even in that, they were one in heart and mind. That's not normal, right? That is, that's not how the world that we live in operates. You know, it's my car is my car. You know, my house is my house. You know, my television is my television. My plate of chips is my plate of chips, all right? I don't share food, just so you know, if you want to come out for a restaurant with me or something like that. The other week, actually, this is a side, we had a curry takeaway with some friends, and my wife, Rachel, she said to me, I'm not feeling that hungry, so I think let's just order one curry and I'll have some of yours. <laughs> no! <laughs> duh, duh, duh. <laughs> my curry's my curry. Get your own. That's how the world in which we work, uh, live operates. You know, Karl Marx actually once claimed that every human attitude and action could be traced back to an economic source. Now, every decision you make, every, every viewpoint you have is motivated at its core by money. And Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, he's not a Marxist, but he's enough of a realist to kind of understand that where our heart is and where our possessions are and where our money is, that's where our heart will be. And much, actually, of the book of Acts is taken up with um, talking and dealing with economic issues within communities. Uh, the book of Luke, he wrote a gospel, it's called the Gospel of Luke, and much of that is also taken up with issues of money because he recognizes that rather than money being some sort of sign of divine approval, money can be a danger. It can lead to selfish ambition over reliance. It can be a tool that we use to try and gain a sense of our worth and our identity. It can be something that we try and use to put our trust in. But somehow, these people now in the church did not see money and possessions in the same way that the world did that they were living in. They didn't see money and possessions as their own. They seemed to be able to hold stuff very lightly and give incredibly generously. And their desire for unity affected their wallets. Now, it wasn't just that they kind of gave like loose change um, to people that were in need. No, we're told that from time to time, people sold houses and fields and property and gave the money to the apostles so that it could be distributed to anyone that was in need. And that is pretty radical living. 
The idea of being one in heart and mind that um, meant that people sacrificed things hugely, even to the point that it affecting their, their status of wealth. And on top of being one in heart and mind, Luke says that God's grace was so powerfully at work among them. And grace is treating people in a way that they don't necessarily deserve to be treated. It's not keeping a record of wrongs. It's grace at the heart is generosity towards other people, not just financially, but relationally. And it says God's grace was powerfully at work among them. It defined their relationships with one another. Without grace for one another, there can be no oneness. Without grace, there can be no unity because people are imperfect. People will disappoint you. People will let you down. People will offend you. So without grace, there will always be disunity. And the church, just like ours, was, was full of imperfect people. They didn't experience oneness and unity because just by some fluke, everyone in the church was absolutely perfect. That's not what happened. Their church was like ours. It was full of imperfect people. But despite their failings, they were able to love each other, be patient and kind towards each other, exercise forgiveness towards each other. Not just kind of superficially or begrudgingly, but quickly and sincerely. And as a result, they stood out in the Roman world in which they lived as unique, as something different. No one else was like them. No one else had that kind of unity and oneness like the church. And so they stood out in the ancient world. And as you read this passage of a group of people that were one in heart and mind, that shared their possessions, that didn't think of things as their own, that extended grace like to everyone in the church, you kind of have to remind yourself that Luke is not kind of talking about some sort of idealistic view of church. This is not some sort of ideal that, you know, everyone should aim towards. He's not kind of painting a picture of a church and say, if a church could be all that it should be, this is what it should be. You know, this is what we need to aim towards. This is what we need to try and achieve. He's he's not painting some sort of picture of something for us to aim towards. Now, all Luke is doing in the book of Acts is just telling us what his actual experience was of being part of a church. A Christian community. And so the question is, how did that happen? How was that his experience of being part of a church? Well, let me, let me just get back to telling you about ice cream and chocolate sauce for a moment. You know, there are a few things that I love in, in life. There are lots of things that I love in life. But if you were to back me into a corner and get me to kind of name my top three or four things in life, it would go like this. God, number one, you know, obviously, given, right? Number two would be my wife, Rachel. Number three, my kids. And number four would be ice cream. Number four would be ice cream. It is amazing. I grant you there are lots of different things in life that are good, but there are fair few things that are actually as good as ice cream. I mean, they're amazing. And this is a, a picture of us, if I've got it. Uh, oh, no, there we are. This is me last weekend. I thought, do you know what? Let's go and get an ice cream, kids. So we drive all the way to Brian to get an ice cream. You can have all sorts of different flavors. There's more flavors than there are days of the year. I mean, every day is an exciting day when it comes to ice cream. And when we go on holiday, um, ice cream is always our biggest budget line. Um, <laughs> It always is without fail. And I'll tell you why. Because I insist that every day on holiday we have an ice cream. We have to have an ice cream. It's a set rule in our family. I'll tell you why. Because um, this simple calculation, if we go back one, uh, a normal day plus ice cream equals an extraordinary day. Um, if you want to know, like, you know the calculation, that's how I've come to work it out. Um, And so on holiday, you know, holidays, every day has got to be an extraordinary day. There's no place for normal days on holiday. So that, because of that, every day has to include ice cream. That's just a fact. That's how we operate as a family. Anyway, rant over. A couple of weeks ago, I'm at home. um, Rachel's out. uh, Kids are in bed. And I think to myself, do you know what? I'm going to have myself a bowl of ice cream. And, and what's nice about having ice cream on your own when the kids are in bed is that you don't just have to have a small portion, you know? 
When you have ice cream with kids, you know, you have to give them a like, little couple of scoops. They seem to think it's rude that I have an adult-sized portion of ice cream. They think it's unfair, even though I'm twice the size of them. I have to be content with a little portion. But when I'm on my own, man, I can have as much as I want. And so I went to the freezer, and I filled my bowl of ice cream up. Uh, and I thought, Do you know what? I'm going to up the ante tonight. I'm going to up the ante. So I went to the kitchen cupboard, and I got out some of this. This stuff. Come across this. Mm. This takes ice cream from just good to extraordinary. All right? It's amazing stuff. You kind of shake it up, and you, you know, put it on your ice cream. And it, it just, it's amazing. And actually on, on the back, it, it says, let your imagination run free. And I'm like, mm -mm, I am letting my imagination run free. And so kind of what I did is um, I popped the lid off and I just, I went for it. I just poured it all over my ice cream. But to my shock, this is what happened. If you've got to have it. <laughs> That's what happened. I mean, I've got to tell you, I was a little disappointed. In fact, I was incredibly disappointed. I mean, how could this happen, you know? The, the bottle on the back, it says, magically transforms ice cream by setting to a chocolatey, chunky, flavored shell right before your eyes. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, that is not what's happened. <laughs> I mean, I felt a little bit sick inside, I've got to be honest. <laughs> you know, after all this effort I went to, and I was like, how can that happen? You know, I checked the date, it's still in date on the top. I looked at the back, and that is when I realized my mistake. I looked at the back, and it says this. Shake the bottle vigorously. <laughs> Pour over ice cream. Oh! You know, in my excitement to get going with eating the ice cream, I've forgotten to shake the bottle. I've forgotten to shake it vigorously. I've just kind of gone at it and poured it straight over, and it just had this kind of soggy mess. No one wants to eat something that's a soggy mess. And so what I did, I thought, well, you know, Rachel will never know. I just scraped it into the bin. <laughs> and I thought, I'll start again. So I filled the bowl with ice cream, and this time I shook that bottle so hard. I tell you, I shook it so hard for so long I couldn't feel my arms anymore. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to make the same mistake twice. And then I poured it all the way over the top. And this is what happened. Mm. <sighs> Let's just go in for a time response right now, shall we? It was pretty special. I tell you, that bowl of ice cream took my normal day to an extraordinary day. And I'm reading this passage in Acts early in the morning. And all I kind of start thinking about is ice cream and chocolate sauce. I think, what am I thinking? You know, what am I thinking about ice cream, chocolate sauce? And it's strange, but I find God speaking to me about it. God often does that with me. He uses kind of everyday things and experiences of life to try and make a point to me. And I suddenly understand what God is highlighting to me about this passage. And something I think he wants to highlight to you as well this morning. How did the church become all that Luke describes it to be? A place of unity, a place of grace for one another, a place of sacrificial giving, a place where no one is in need. How, how was that possible? Because that kind of place is, is not normal, right? No matter how much a bunch of people try to be kind of united in that sort of way, they might be able to maintain it for a little bit, but it's not sustainable. It's not possible to do with a random group of people. So how was it possible? Well, the answer is found in, in verse 31 that we read. It says this, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And Luke, the, the writer of Acts, is not just trying to spice up his um, narrative a little bit. He's not adding, this is not Steven Spielberg adding some special effects in. The shaking is why Luke is able to go on and describe the church in the way that he does. The shaking is transformative because it's the coming of the presence of God. Before the church, 
can be anything or do anything, it must be shaken well before use. Whenever people encounter God's presence, there's always a shaking. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, we read about a moment when Moses, who's the leader of the Israelite people, he, he goes up a mountain to be in the presence of God. And what it says is the mountain trembled. Things that look solid when you're in the presence of God begin to shake. And when God's presence came, the, the mountain shock shook. It's something that God's people remembered for generations. A long time afterwards, you get this prophet Isaiah, and he, once, he writes this, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. He's saying, God, would you come again? Would your presence come again in power and shake things up again? Why? Because when you experience the presence of God in the room, everything that looks so strong and so solid suddenly becomes shaky. Next to God's power, all other things that might impress us as power all of a sudden seem weak and begin to shake. Next to God's incredible love for us, all other things that may appear to be love actually seem quite shallow and begin, begin to shake. All the things that we put our value in, when we are in God's presence and understand something of his value for us, all of a sudden seem a little bit shaky after a while. And this was King David's experience that we read about in the Old Testament. When King David experienced the presence of God, it led him on to write a song which includes this line, your love is better than life. That's an extraordinary statement. He's saying, I've experienced the presence of God and that and his love. And I can tell you, it's the best thing that I've ever experienced. It's the best thing that's happened to me. It's better than life itself. It's better than anything life could offer. It's better than possessions, money, anything in the physical world. Everything else has become shaky because I've experienced the presence of God. The Apostle Paul, after he experienced the presence of God, he goes on to say that he counted everything else as rubbish compared to knowing him. And you get the impression from both David and Paul that to experience the presence of God is not just some kind of nice addition to your life. To experience God's presence isn't just a nice thing to have on a sideline that's going to help you in some way. No, to experience the presence of God is to transform your life. In the light of God's presence, it puts everything else in perspective. Everything else that you thought would be so solid, all of a sudden becomes shaky. And God knew that if the church was going to be all that he desired it to be, then they must encounter his presence. It would shake everything else that they thought was solid, but it was necessary to do before they could do anything that's going to be of any, any benefit. And that's what happened to the followers of Jesus as they prayed. The presence of God came upon them, and the things that they thought were solid started to shake. Money didn't seem to matter anymore. Possessions didn't seem to matter anymore. People's view of them, their status just didn't seem to matter anymore. When they experience the power and the presence of God, their conclusion is it's better than life. It's better than life. And they were united because all of them had experienced of it. All of them had been filled with the Holy Spirit. A church that is not shaken by the presence and the power of God before it's used will always be a disappointment. Just like the chocolate sauce that I poured over my first bowl of ice cream. It, it won't leave people going, wow, that is amazing. A church that has not been shaken by the presence of God before it tries to go out into the community, it won't impact communities in the way that it was designed to. 
it won't be a place of unprecedented unity. It may have all the functions of the church, but it won't have any of the flavor of what the church should be. If a church tries to pour itself out onto the world, then no matter where it goes, whether that's kind of like businesses or uh, hospitals or schools or social projects or even in family life, if it tries to pour itself out into the world without the presence of God, then it will just go blur. And the world will look at it and go, yuck. But if we pray, and if God shakes us, the church has the ability to transform neighborhoods and nations. In the church are all the ingredients of God's kingdom being demonstrated on earth in spectacular style. And those ingredients are are you and I and God through his Holy Spirit. And sometimes it can, a church can maybe be a little bit like this. It can be like a, to give you another source-based product. It can be a little bit like Italian dressing. It's got all the ingredients in there. You can see them all. You know, you've got spices and stuff at the bottom, and then you've got, you know, kind of uh, vinegar and oil and lemon juice. It's all kind of separated out there like that. You pour that out, it, it won't won't be much good. What you need to do before you use it, all the elements are there, but what you need to do before you need it, you need to shake it up. And when you do it, this is what happens. Everything that is separated becomes united. And when it's poured out, it it adds flavor. If we, as a church, are going to have the grace for one another, if we're going to have hearts, be one in heart and mind, if we're going to be generous, not only with our attitudes, but also our resources, then we need God to shake us vigorously, to fill us with his Holy Spirit before he uses us. Any attempt to be um, the church without God changing us from the inside is doomed to fail because the world can spot a fake a mile off. I don't think there's any coincidence that actually after this passage where um, Luke talks about such oneness and such unity and such sense of grace and community that he goes on actually to tell a little bit of an account of a a couple couple in the church called Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira did what a number of the people in the church were told did. They sold a piece of property and and they brought the proceeds and, and put it at the apostles' feet. They just made one small mistake, but it's actually quite a big mistake. What they did is they brought it all and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, it's their money. It's up to them what they do, right? It's up to them how much they give. But what they did is they gave it, and they gave the impression that they gave all of it. But they kept some of it back for themselves. Keeping some back is fine, but it was the fact that they tried to give the impression that they were being incredibly generous, when in actual fact... All they're really after is for people to think they're generous, to think they are one in heart and mind. And what happens is when they're confronted about it, they drop down dead, both of them. It's a really hard passage to read. In fact, we were going to skip right over it (laughs) and move on. But I don't think it's any coincidence that it's there just after Luke has been talking about such oneness. God takes his church really seriously. And I think what it's saying is God doesn't want something that's fake. He doesn't want something that's fake. He doesn't want a church that on the outside appears to be generous, but on the inside it's not generous. He doesn't want a church that says it's united, but in actual fact there's kind of division and stuff. He takes his church really seriously. There's no place for faking it. God wants a church that is full of one mind. Not a church that pretends that one that's been transformed in the inside. A church that is united, full of integrity, where people are not fake with each other, but out of a desire for status, but are one in heart and mind. It's the presence of God that makes that happen. Now the passage that we've 
uh, read isn't the first time that we read that they encountered the presence of God. You read it on the day of Pentecost, it says they're filled with the Holy Spirit. You read it when some of them stand up and they speak to religious leaders, Jewish leaders, it says they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And it happens again here. Paul, when he writes to one of the churches, he, he says, don't just kind of be shaken up once. Keep on being shaken up. Keep on being filled. It's not a one-time thing. We must keep on coming into the presence of God and saying, God, would you shake us? You know, just like this bottle, I, 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 I haven't used it for a couple of weeks now. I can guarantee if I poured it over my ice cream again, it would be a bit of a soggy mess again. Every time I use it, I've got to shake it. If we want God to be demonstrated in a glorious way, if we want complete unity and oneness, if we want to share our possessions, if we want to be generous with our time and our words, then we need God not just to shake us once, but to continue to shake us vigorously. That we would be people that experience his presence over and over and over again. That he would shake us before that we're used. So that when we're used, people look and go, wow. Wow. That's not, that's a beautiful thing. Look at that group. There's nothing else like the church. I can't see anything else like it. Look at their unity. Look at their oneness. Isn't it amazing? I want to be a part of that because I don't know anything else that's like that in this world. Before we get used by God, We've got to ask him to shake us.